Uh, we're going to get started partly because this is the beginning of Memorial Day weekend, and I suspect a few of you may have some plans uh, to enjoy the great weather. Uh, my name is Todd Summers. I work here at the Global Health Policy Center at CSIS. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to follow up on some previous discussions and reports that we've done on some of the opportunities and challenges in transitioning uh, our PEPFAR program uh, from uh, a high reliance on some of our international NGO partners to more local uh, uh, partners. Uh, Chip and I were sitting together about a year and a half or so ago at one of the other CSIS events. I think it was uh, on the PEPFAR evaluation. And people were talking about this transition, and he started to vibrate. Uh, and I said, so what's going on, Chip? And he said, well, they talk about this transition as if it's somehow easy uh, and simple to do. Um, and in fact, it's incredibly complicated uh, and takes quite a bit of time, uh, investment, um, and capacity on both sides. Uh, so we promised to do something to follow up with that discussion. So we are here today to do that. I suspect that uh, in the coming months, you'll see uh, CSIS do some more uh, events on various aspects of this question around transition and sustainability. It's something that's facing PEPFAR. It's something that's facing Gavi. It's something that's facing the Global Fund. Uh, it's an ongoing challenge with a lot of uh, interesting and, and complex side issues, and we want to get into those some. So you'll, you'll probably see more events uh, that are uh, connected somehow to today's conversation. We have three great panelists, in addition to Chip Lyons, who runs the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. We have Anya Giphart, who's the new medical director uh, for uh, EGPAF. Uh, as well as Paula Vaz, who runs uh, an affiliate organization in Mozambique. So we're going to get both the global perspective, uh, some of the country's perspective, and then the real uh, perspective uh, from Paula. So we're going to go right through today with having the three of them give some introductory comments, and now we're going to move right to you to uh, do Q&A. So we should be uh, done with the presentations in about 30 minutes, and that should leave us about an hour for dialogue uh, with those of you who are here. We also have about 100 people who are online. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you want to tweet in some questions, we'll try to get those put forward as well. So Chip, um, over to you. Thank you, Todd. Um, thank you all for coming and for those that are online uh, for making the time. Um, I didn't realize my vibrating is, is what uh, <laughs> led uh, to this. But we do appreciate the opportunity to talk about this really fascinating uh, issue. I should just pause it at the beginning. Um, we are not here to suggest one size or one model uh, fits all, because that is clearly not the case. On the other hand, um, we had some very substantial challenges uh, put to us around transition um, in about 2009, with a hard deadline by 2012. Um, and we feel uh, pretty good about um, the steps that we took, um, how deliberate and um, pretty methodical they were, and then more importantly, of course, what the outcomes um, have been so far three years uh, after that transition. Um, I uh, just want to say a couple words about you know, of context to make sure you sort of understand what our thinking has been, uh, where we're coming from. Uh, EGPAF's mission, you, know, you may know, is to end AIDS in children. Um, we pursue strategies around research, advocacy, and program implementation. We support over 7,000 sites, um, primarily in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Uh, for many, uh, EGPAF, Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, is synonymous with PMTCT, uh, the Prevention of Mother-to-Child Transmission. Um, in fact, to end AIDS in children, we need to do much more than pursue a PMTCT strategy. And I think most or many of you know that um, the challenges around the so-called PMTCT cascade um, are material um, to the degree that um, about a third of kids who should be receiving care and treatment are actually receiving it compared to closer to 60 or 65 percent uh, of adults, particularly uh, pregnant women. So there's a lag for kids. The PMTCT cascade has real problems. You cannot rely on that alone to achieve a mission of uh, ending pediatric AIDS. Therefore, um, we are very active in um, several other areas, very purposeful integration of PMTC2 services into a broader maternal and child health uh, setting. Um, health system strengthening um, is crucial. 
Uh, and of course, this issue of transition, which is uh, not just programmatically important, but it's politically important from a sustainability uh, point of view. Uh, our mission being uh, what it is um, has evolved. We're 25 years old as a foundation. Um, it was started by uh, Elizabeth uh, Glazer. You may know she contracted the virus um, uh, uh, from a blood transfusion giving birth in uh, 1981. Her firstborn, Ariel Glazer, um, uh, uh, got the virus through breastfeeding. Um, her secondborn, uh, Jake uh, contracted the virus uh, in utero. Um, Ariel passed at age seven in 1988, and after a period of pretty intense uh, mourning and uh, almost hopelessness, um, Elizabeth rose up, we often say like a mother would, um, and her mission really at the time was to address the needs of one child, Jake. She was uh, bent on saving Jake's life. Um, I won't go through the uh, quite remarkable role that she played, but in no small part, there was a dramatic change in the, trend, in the trajectory of HIV and AIDS, even the face of HIV and AIDS in the United States. Uh, um, Elizabeth um, uh, passed um, in 1994. Jake is alive and well and healthy and working, and in many respects, obviously, is a sign of Elizabeth's success in that first small mission of one child has become a, a global mission. Um, EGPAF was uh, one of um, four uh, implementation partners in CDC's award called Track one or called um, uh, Project Heart. Um, we started in the late 90s in a handful of clinics um, to um, make available uh, nevirapine, which had been identified as having a material effect on the transmission from uh, mother to child. Uh, PEPFAR, of course, um, allowed that work to scale up uh, dramatically, and CDC came forward, created um, the so-called Track One program. There were four implementation partners within Track One, uh, EGPAF, Harvard, uh, AIDS Relief, and ICAP. Um, we uh, were charged uh, within our award uh, to work in five countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Zambia, South Africa, Mozambique, and uh, Tanzania. Um, during the course of the eight years of that award, as um, we went through it with CDC, in those five countries, EGPAF's uh, role, um, we worked with um, to over 200 uh, different partners in those countries um, around care and treatment as well as capacity building. Um, over 500,000, 560,000 uh, patients were enrolled on ART care and treatment for a million um, and testing and counseling for 2.5 million uh, uh, HIV positive, uh, excuse me, 2.5 million pregnant women. Um, you know, in 2009, though, at the start of Track One, transition and transition objectives um, had not been delineated. It was the follow-on funding in 2009 where that component was introduced uh, by HRSA. Um, it was a, um, a goal, a requirement set uh, where the work we were doing, the services we were providing, and so on and so forth, would be transitioned to a national partner by February of 2012. Uh, we did that in all five countries um, in different ways. In South Africa and, and, um, and Zambia, we transferred our work to existing organizations in those two countries, um, albeit in slightly different ways, which we can talk about. In the other countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, and Mozambique, um, our assessment was we would need to help create uh, a new organization, one in each of those countries, that was mission focused, that had the capability, the competence um, to be to receive uh, direct funding uh, from CDC. And those three organizations have been created. Paula is the executive director of the Fundação uh, Ariel in Mozambique, about which uh, she will speak. Um, more on, as will Anya talk about a number of other things. Um, just closing, um, you know, we went through the track one um, closeout uh, meetings and so on uh, with CDC. 
Um, they are very much to be commended uh, with HRSA and the other Track 1 partners because it really was a remarkable um, set of accomplishments over that uh, period of time. Um, they estimated because of Track 1 that in 2012, 20% of all Africans who had been enrolled on ART was a result of Track 1. That's um, uh, pretty stunning. The other thing that was uh, kind of dramatic um, is that uh, by putting in that transition requirement, it forced action, thinking, strategy, decision making around uh, transition. And I emphasize the word forced. <laughs> Um, that's very much what it felt like. Um, I remember at the time using words like unrealistic and unreasonable um, in terms of what this uh, requirement was. Um, in hindsight, I, not only do I think it was the right decision on their part uh, to take, but it was probably overdue. Uh, I think for those of us that believe strongly in sustainable um, outcomes, sustainable uh, development, and yet sometimes struggle with how best to achieve that, maybe even not even agreeing on the definition of sustainability. I think this is a material part and contribution to that strategy. And I, I occasionally wonder where would we be had we made those kinds of commitments 10 years ago or 15 years ago in terms of methodical, deliberate, measured capacity building in a, a variety of countries. Uh, and finally, it's clearly consistent with the policy emphasis that PEPFAR has placed for several years on increasing national ownership and national uh, leadership. And that's a position and a policy that Ambassador Burks has already spoken to uh, on a number of occasions. So it fits. It's not just a project outcome. It's an integral part of a larger policy and strategy uh, for <coughs> PEPFAR. There are a bunch of issues attendant to that, though, from definitions and time frames and costs and so on, and that's what we'll be able to get into a little bit more. So you're going to dump that on Anya. Uh, <laughs> so Anya. Like I do most work. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anya, welcome to your new position yeah. at uh, EGPAF, and uh, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about some of the uh, opportunities and complexity that uh, Chip alluded to. Yes, thank you. Um, like Chip said, um, you know, it did not only fit in, in the overall picture uh, of development, I think the whole uh, transition did also very much fit in what the organization has always believed needs to happen. And even uh, all our other existing programs work through ministries of health, um, work at district level. We provide at the moment over 200 sub-grants to local entities. So the whole... Uh, experience did fit very much already with, in our beliefs of long-term sustainability and local ownership. Um, but like Chip said, uh, the time frame was slightly different than we maybe had in mind initially. Um, so also like Chip mentioned, uh, we did establish the three affiliates uh, in Mozambique, Tanzania, and Cote d'Ivoire because after our assessment, knowing that we had to transition to national entities, either government or uh, NGOs, we didn't find any suitable candidates at that point in time in those countries. Um, so what does it really mean, those, uh, the, affiliate, the affiliates, and how do we relate to them? Um, it's really based on the idea that to fulfill our mission, we need to work with lots of partners. And that's also what we share very strongly with our uh, affiliate organizations, the same mission to eliminate pediatric HIV. Um, the other tenant that's really important uh, for this relationship is that there is this assessment of capacity that is continuous. We have an accreditation uh, review where the uh, affiliate first looks at a number of critical areas and does a self-assessment and then later on um, ACPAF comes to verify and discuss what are the areas where additional support could ha happen. Um, the other area is really that we continue uh, to work together and see where the capacity needs to be built and how we share lessons learned because we learn as much from the affiliates as the affiliates learn from us, hopefully. Um, so how did we go about it? Um, we initially started in those three countries uh, with our existing ACPAF staff who looked at uh, recruiting a, a highly qualified board in country uh, created bylaws, uh, registered the affiliate, and then subsequently we started out by providing a subgrant to the affiliate so that they could 
get the experience of actually supporting program implementation. We did that also with actually seconding some of our own staff to the organization. Um, this created the situation that they did have a track record and therefore were able to subsequently uh, secure funding from the US government. Um, and at the same time, ACPAF also was able to secure follow-on funding to continue supporting both program implementation, but as well also really support to the affiliate on a longer term basis. And I think that transition, at least for us, I think has proven to be very successful. Um, it was very well thought through. Um, it was stepwise. Uh, like I said, initially, we were responsible for the service uh, support in certain areas. Then it was transferred to the affiliate, but through a subgrant. So still, ECPAF was ultimately responsible. And then finally, the affiliate did receive their, their own funding to continue that support. But then again, we still had a relationship with the affiliate through the affiliation agreement and with the funding to continue looking how that went and where support was needed. And I think that has resulted that in all those three countries, the affiliates has been very successful, but also their program implementation portfolio has continued to grow. And the sites that were supported through this um, never had a gap and services continu continued without any fault. Um, so I think one of the challenge that we're facing currently is really to see how are we moving forward, both having ACPAF and the affiliates in country, and what is uh, our role going to be? And I think, talking from what Chip said earlier, um, the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation has evolved a lot over time. We started out really focusing on advocacy, putting children on the HIV agenda, and um, providing funds for the necessary <coughs> research. Then when, um, there was a way of preventing uh, mother-to-child transmission. Um, we started getting much more involved in program implementation and support because that was the biggest need. Um, I think now um, we are evolving more and more, working at a global level, working with UN agencies, with PEPFAR, with Global Fund, um, to see you know, what needs to be done to make sure that children do stay on the agenda and the elimination is very much in the forefront. Um, as well that we also just recently uh, received a TA award through CDC where we have the capacity now and the capabilities to support countries receiving um, PEPFAR funding as well as Global Fund funding and provide technical assistance. So I think we're again evolving into a, a new area. Having said that, um, with our mission to eliminate pediatric HIV, we we do feel strongly that there is a role also for us at the moment in program implementation and country presence, but we're figuring out when do we transfer that to more TA and providing other types of support again. So that's kind of maybe where I hand over. That all Paula. sounds so lovely. So Paula, what's the reality? How is it going for you? <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, so I'll be speaking. Uh, on I'll be speaking uh, on behalf of Fundação Ariel Glazer. Uh, we are a local organization working in Mozambique um, to achieve that vision of eliminating pediatric AIDS at country level. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it was difficult, uh, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm just playing with this and this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so, uh, we are one of the three affiliates, and in Mozambique, prior to the transition, uh, Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric Aids Foundation worked in four provinces. And in uh, a period of two years, there, there were two provinces that transitioned from ECPAF to Ariel. So by transition, we mean that uh, both the staff and the, the activities in that province entirely transition from the international organization to the local organization. And in this transition period, we had to uh, grow and deliver high quality programs. Uh, at the same time, uh, not trying not to jeopardize the gains that uh, had been done 
by EDPATH over the years. So it was a huge challenge. We had, to, we had an advantage of being affiliated to Elizabeth Coase Pediatric AIDS Foundation. That meant that we received a lot of support at the beginning. We didn't have to create uh, the systems, the policies, and everything. We just uh, adapted it. But we had to hire staff, and we had to run. Um, In this, in this slide, I had to kind of highlight uh, aspects that I think are critical for the success of this uh, overall uh, transition process that happened in a really short period uh, and with uh, fairly good results. In three years, we have moved from uh, one staff to 98. We are now providing support today to 190 sites. We, in three years, we have provided the counseling and testing to more than 300,000 people. And we have uh, near one, nearly 110,000 people on antiretroviral treatment. So it was, uh, it was huge to achieve this. And uh, I think that I would uh, put it in three categories, international, in, internal growth, program implementation, and networking. And I think that if I had to point out uh, the most important factor for this, it's human resources, the staff. The staff are critical uh, to achieve success. And we had the opportunity to hire uh, skilled staff. and. St the staff is 100% national. Uh, we have a board of directors that is, uh, that is national, but ECPAF has appointed a representative in the board of directors. That representative stays here in uh, Washington, but participates uh, in, the, in the governance, uh, either sometimes being present or uh, at distance. Uh, the governance structure also plays an important role in the overall conduction and uh, guiding and orientation of the, the way the organization uh, is structured and is actually implementing the programs. So besides the, the staff, I think that it's very important that from the beginning we have uh, a strategic thinking and we actually conduct a strategic planning involving all the actors in place. Uh, not just ECPAF, but other partners, uh, international partners or local partners, uh, donors, we have involved the CDC and other uh, donors in country. And it was a thorough and deep thinking uh, while we were structuring our strategic planning. And actually, our strategic planning has been our <coughs> backbone uh, to not to lose our mind while uh, we are growing. Because there are so many opportunities and so much to do that we really need to have a strong backbone. Um, and of course, audits. Uh, the affiliation agreements. Uh, allows ECPAF to do uh, an accreditation of the affiliate. And we consider that accreditation process as an organizational audit. They come, there is a team coming from Washington, and that, team, that team does a thorough review of programmatic and operations and governance in every area. And uh, it's, it's very constructive uh, during the accreditation process we identify strengths and weaknesses, and based on those weaknesses, we build uh, an action plan that actually helps us to focus on our weaknesses and uh, have um, a strong and fast growth. Uh, at the level of program implementation, uh, I, I have already uh, told about staff, and uh, by having uh, uh, local staff, with a thorough knowledge uh, of the local context, the cultural, the health, the environmental issues is very important. We work very closely uh, with the local structures, the Ministry of Health, the local partners at all levels. And I think that that deep knowledge 
facilitates us uh, implementing uh, in a better way. We are more, uh, I would say, more easy to adapt to the country changes, to the country needs, and uh, we are always trying to innovate and to think ahead of how to deliver better programs. And uh, networking is also important. I, I think that we haven't paid enough attention to communications, and communications is critical, internal and external communications. Uh, not everybody uh, knows about uh, this process. The transition process had lots of question marks at the beginning, as Ship said, it was a bit forced. And everybody thought, who are these locals? What are they going to do? I mean, uh, are local, local organizations have a bad reputation, especially for mismanagement. Um, and also at the technical level. So we have proved that we can uh, deliver both technically and financially, and our portfolio is, is fast growing. So I'm sorry by being back so forth. So, <laughs> so uh, I'd like to thank your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks. Uh, Carl, I'm going to put you on the spot in a minute, but I. Um, <laughs> One of the things that we did recently, uh, Steve led a de delegation about a year and a half ago to South Africa, and I was on a follow-up discussion or trip um, last spring, both of them looking at the issue of PEPFAR transition in South Africa, which is one of the leading countries um, to, to move in that direction. Um, and we identified a lot of positive things, but also a lot of challenges, um, particularly in actually transitioning patient care from one provider to another. Uh, and one of the challenges that we saw was as the South African government took over responsibility, its translation of what that meant was actually taking over the programs, uh, literally. So they were hiring the uh, doctors and nurses that worked for the NGOs into government positions and not hiring a lot of the community health workers who had been the backbones of those programs because there wasn't a coding in government employment for them. So they were, in, in, at least in the views of some, kind of eviscerating the best qualities of the NGOs that have been surviving uh, and doing work in that country even under very adverse situations. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could, uh, Paula, tell us a little bit around how has been working with the Mozambique government um, and you as an NGO, and how does this interaction on the international place work? And then maybe if you have some comments on that, and then we'll turn to Carl, who runs another large NGO. I think may have some thoughts on this, and then we'll turn it to others. Uh, thank you. Um, in Mozambique right now, we have this uh, acceleration plan. It's a, a Minister of Health acceleration plan for uh, improving access, 20% uh, of the eligible people until the end of next year. So people are virtually running against the clock to, to do a massive scale up. So the Minister of Health itself was not uh, really sure about, uh, are these international organizations transition to local organizations that have not yet performed? How, how are, are is this going to, to mess up with our plan of getting more people on treatment? And uh, yes, uh, the curves continue to grow. Today there are two local organizations. Uh, the local organization that uh, was created by ICAP and us that are affiliated to EGPAF. And the two organizations today account for 25% of the overall patients in the country. So it's, it, it, it is a growth, and the numbers just continue rising. And that uh, has helped the Minister of Health to be confident in the local organizations. And uh, I mean, it's not a big country. Uh, it's a 20 million people country. So uh, we, there is a, a network in health, and we, we kind of have uh, created uh, confident relationships. And the local governments uh, have greeted us with every year we, we have been awarded this 
diploma of recognition from the government that a knowledge uh, Ariel Foundation has a performance organization. And I mean, it, it makes us proud. Uh, we, we have a very good relationship with the Minister of Health. Yeah, to answer your question, I think our, our experience in the three countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, and Mozambique, has just been very different than the one in South Africa. Um, and so in, in those three countries, it wasn't the government who was taking over uh, from our original support. It was the affiliates who took over. And as I just earlier described, I think there was really this, this phased approach where there was a lot of follow-up and discussion between the two organizations supporting the sites. Um, also, I think what is different in South Africa that there are a lot of seconded staff working um, in the facilities, and I think seconded that Seconded kind of, from AGPAF. Yes, seconded yeah. from AGPAF to, to the facilities, while in the other countries we have that far, far less. There might be some seconded people, but most of the time it's at like a national level, supporting, overseeing a much larger scope of work, but not actually healthcare providers uh, that are AGPAF employees providing the services. So I think that's made it very different. Uh, Todd, also in South Africa, uh, of the five countries, it was the only country where, uh, by virtue of the follow-on awards that were made, um, EGPAF transitioned 100% of its programmatic work. All of those staff that had been seconded were moved into uh, Department of Health, for example, or into um, other organizations, health systems, uh, trust, received follow-on funding to take that. Um, that handoff, if you will, or the transition. And it's the one out of the five where EGPEF did not have an ongoing role. We don't have a presence in South Africa anymore. Um, and so have a, a limited window on the subsequent actions and the, the um, uh, patient care after 2012, whereas we're still in the other four countries in some capacity or another. Great, so we're gonna to turn to uh, you for questions or comments. Um, there's a couple seats up here. Shep, if you wanna come have a seat, there's uh, some here. Uh, Carl, I just noticed you're here. I'm gonna put you on the spot, but you run another international NGO and you certainly have confronted this issue. It would be great to get your perspective, uh, Lindsay. We'll give you the mic so the people online can hear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Todd, and thank you to the panelists. Very interesting. So I'm Carl Hoffman. I run uh, PSI, Population Services International, and as Todd says, we and everybody else who has a, a series of national offices or presence um, strategy faces this challenge and, and also is uh, getting a lot of pressure from our U.S. funders in particular to, to follow the sort of path that you described. And uh, so one of my questions was about the governance relationship between the two organizations, but you already answered that, Paula, by saying that EGPAF sits on your board in a minority capacity, it sounds like. I guess I have three other questions, and let's put them all under the heading of financial related. So the first question would be, what's the financial relationship like between EGPAF and the Fundación? Um, the second is, under your affiliation agreement, could the foundation partner with another international NGO, receive funding through another international NGO, or are they tied uniquely to EGPAF? And third, and perhaps most important, you know, our friends at CDC and at USAID, but certainly at CDC, sometimes, believe it or not, have problems with funding cycles. So <laughs> what happens in that period when, in the case where CDC may be funding the activities of the foundation, what happens when there's a three or six month gap in the cash that they're prepared to provide? Does EGPAF step in? <laughs> three finance related questions. Go ahead, Paul. Well, thank you for your questions. Um, we are, uh, let's say, financially independent because we receive our grants directly from CDC. Uh, though uh, we receive a small grant of private funds from EGPAF, uh, that uh, it's like um, it creates a bit of a cushion if there are uh, other um, activities 
to be financed that cannot be funded through the CDC grant. I would say like we have published our uh, strategic planning or our first year of activities or second year of activities, we use that money. Uh, so we are accountable to CDC. Uh, through the affiliation agreement, I, I think that uh, is, uh, is a contract that the, does allow the two organizations to independently partner to other organizations, either national <coughs> or international. I mean, it's, uh, it gives us freedom to do that. And uh, finally, we have been lucky with that funding cycle, but uh, if we stay, like you, you, you've given an example, five or six months without funding, it's gonna ca uh, cause us a huge stress. And yeah, I, I don't have, or, yes, yes, I don't have uh, an answer. Yeah. And unrestricted funds don't, aren't, you don't have them. We, yes. So we got, we got online, so use the microphone. So I think you're saying that most organizations don't have unrestricted funds. Well, many, organ no. many national organizations, even those that we have helped create, might have very limited unrestricted funds, or they might rely on the, the original partner for a grant to help them do the sorts of things that funders won't fund. But for the major core activities, I'm sure this is the case for Chip and his team. I mean, we essentially wind up funding CDC during long periods when they are you know uh, between funding cycles, uh, and the same is true with USAID. Now, and it's more than probably the Young Foundation can do, and I think that's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. Can I maybe answer? To Please. Um, it's definitely a challenge, and I think one of the types of support that we are moving into now, compared to initially, like Paula said, working on the the financial system and the HR systems, it's now really focusing more and more on resource mobilization and diversification to try to at least um, be ahead of the game. But it is definitely one of the challenges, I think, the unrestricted, the, the, the limited or no availability of unrestricted fundings to do these things. Um, Carl, can I add a, a fourth financial bucket um, point that you kindly didn't ask, which is, what happens if Ariel and EGPAF are pursuing the same funding source uh, for activity in Mozambique? Um, Paula wins, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would never dare to compete with, uh, Paula. with Paula. Um, but we, we just this spring in our annual uh, program review with Paula and the executive directors of the other two affiliates, the, the short answer is we don't know exactly how we're, it's just gonna take a cold-eyed view of that our commitment is for the growth and the sustainability of Ariel in Mozambique. And so there's a sort of primus inter pares position there. But what is the donor looking for? What are the criteria in particular? Can we partner um, for something like that? Um, it could very well be that uh, at a certain level, it would look like both organizations would want to pursue that. But that doesn't make sense for us to compete with each other. We don't um, intend to or want to, to do that. But it also requires on the, on the international organization a real comfort level with decline in resources. Um, I mean, there's $30 million right now in direct programming assistance through the three affiliates that six years ago would have been um, at EGPAF. You comfortable with that? Is your board comfortable with that? There are watchdog organizations that ding you if you don't show consistent growth by virtue of your bottom line, which is, to my view, nonsensical. Are you more effective 25% uh, smaller than you were five years ago? I think that ought to be probably the first consideration. But we, we've internalized these things. We are comfortable as part of it. It helps to be really focused on the mission and to know that REL is focused on the mission. We want them to succeed. We're invested in their success. And you have a, you have a global agenda so you also could run the risk where one of these affiliates isn't fulfilling the responsibilities that you see uh, as needed to, uh, to accomplish your global agenda. So what do you do if they fail their, uh, their review and you feel a need to basically go in and do what they're not doing? Well, I, I frankly think we can't go in. They are independent organizations, so we can I'm advise. into the country, not to yeah. the organization. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, because otherwise I would say they are independent organization and we can advise. And if we really feel they are not performing, we could break the affiliation agreement, but otherwise they, 
they make their own decisions. And, and that, that's, I mean, that's absolutely true, but there's also the component if they're not meeting targets, for example. The first, the conversations are, are, are also with us because of the nature of our collaboration, but those conversations are also with the donor. And it doesn't go from you know, accolades for your progress to we're cutting all of your funding right now. So I don't know that it would be quite as abrupt as, as you described, and I don't think the first response would be let's get EggPath back here. We'd have to go through a, a very deliberate uh, process with the donor, directly with the affiliate, but we, in different ways, formally and informally, would be a part of the conversation. So questions from uh, folks who are here. Uh, we have one here. Why don't we do a couple, uh, and then we'll get people to respond in groups. So, um. Hi, Rachel Dessam at IntraHealth. Um, I'm curious to know, we've talked a lot about the international financing, and I'd be curious to hear about national financing, the role of Mizao or other um, health financers within the country. Um, and in addition, from the human resources perspective, um, Paul, I'd be really interested to hear also about the communication strategy you had with healthcare providers themselves on the ground and how that transition took place. Mm. Thanks. Great. Uh, other questions over in that neighborhood? Over here? Well, why don't we take this one while you sort of work up your courage? Because I've got lots of questions. I got more. Yeah, Carl's got more. So we're going to bore you to tears if you don't start raising your hands. So let's go uh, with a question around sort of your communication with uh, some of the local health work workers and some of the local funding sources. Thank you. Um, talking about the local funding, uh, we are we, we are also looking internally. Uh, Ms. Al, I mean, the Ministry of Health is not a potential funding. The Ministry of Health itself is struggling to, to get funds to run uh, the programs on a routine basis. But uh, there are uh, potential for public-private partnerships, and we are, explore, we are exploring that. Uh, Mozambique has been known over the past couple of years for... Uh, um, lots of local resources that have been recently discovered. Uh, there are uh, lots of national and international companies exploring that. And uh, we are working on to establish uh, PPPs with them in order to, to raise some, uh, some money and appealing to their social responsibility. Uh, in what relates your second, uh, your second question about communication, uh, with the, the health providers at the health facility. I mean, it, it, was, uh, it was easier, easy. It was uh, relatively easy because uh, we, we were working at the, at the province level with the teams that were already in place and with uh, good relationships with, um, with people at the health facility. So we, prior to the transition, we started communicated about, uh, communicating about the transition process, the meaning of it, and ensuring that there won't be differences in terms of uh, support provided financially or uh, technically. And uh, based on that open communication, we had lots of meetings at provincial, district, and health facility level and it has worked well. There was not a change in the people that were actually providing uh, support at the site level, so yes, yeah, I, I, I might say, yes, it worked well. Paul, you emphasized that some of that activity or a lot of that activity um, happened before the transition. How did that get funded? If, you, if Ariel didn't exist yet, how did you get to conduct those kinds of activities that were uh, contributing to the transition process? Um, that said, I mean, the, transi the transition did, didn't happen all of a sudden. Uh, while we were created, uh, there was a gap between the transition of one province and there was a six-month uh, period of preparing the transition of the first province and then a one-year period before the transition of the second province that allowed us to do a transition preparation together with EGPAF. 
So one of the things that must worry you a little bit, I, I, I assume, is now that you have over 100,000 people for whom you're providing direct uh, treatment, that's a lifelong responsibility. Uh, it sounds like most of your funding is coming from here. Uh, how does that make you feel? How, what's your, do you have anxiety around your ability to be able to sustain that support over the long time? Are you, are you looking for the Mozambique government to kick in? Are you expecting that the mineral resources that have been found are gonna somehow fill that gap? How do, you, how do you see five or 10 years out into the future? Um, that's right. There is, <laughs> <laughs> there is a bit of anxiety around that. It's not just at the personal level or at an organizational level. I would say at the country level, at the regional level, at the international level, at the global level. Uh, there is a, a general anxiety about all these people uh, being put on treatment and the resources needed to guarantee treatment, life treatment for them. Uh, I would say that um, we are uh, building on and we have a great wor uh, work doing through, uh, through health system strengthening. I mean, we are uh, building local capacity. That, that doesn't mean that uh, the funds will be there, but there is an increased uh, political commitment for the government to absorb the programs progressively. And we are working towards a second phase of transition that is transition the programs to the government. From the, NG the local NGOs like yours to the government? There will be transition, certainly. Interesting. Admiral. I'm Tom Cullison from Uniform Services University. I apologize for arriving late, and you may have covered this in your remarks before I arrived, but uh, along with Todd's question, with that many people under treatment, that requires healthcare workers or professional staff to carry out those, those responsibilities for many years. Does your organization, are you concerned about the number and capability of the staff that will do this, and do you support uh, efforts to educate, train, and develop that staff? Yeah, please. Uh, yes, uh, we, we have 98 staff. 98 staff is not enough to provide treatment for, for uh, more than 100,000 uh, people. What we do is providing support to, it, to the existing Ministry of Health structures and health facility levels. Uh, um, we do a direct technical assistance um, work. We, we do a health system, uh, health system strengthening, we do capacity building, we do lots of training, and we also uh, have a system of sub-agreements in place uh, by which we, we allocate a certain amount of money to the provincial health directorate or to the district or to the health facility or to the nurses' school uh, uh, to train people. And uh, by that sub-agreement, uh, we, we do a joint planning and we kind of negotiate the targets to be achieved and the activities or, or equipment, uh, uh, the activities to be done or the equipment to be bought in order to achieve those targets. And that's the same for training. Uh, we, we are providing sub-agreements to improve and to increase the training of nurses, medical officers, uh, te uh, technical uh, uh, pharmacists, uh, lab people, so that <coughs> more uh, more staff will be there to to be uh, to be able to accomplish. Uh, Anya, what does that look like in the other countries that you're working in? How 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 typical is the situation yeah. that Paula describes? It's we have the same approach. Uh, we don't have ECPAF clinics or anything like that. ECPAF doctors. We work through the existing systems. Like I started out uh, saying that, really from the beginning when we started supporting uh, those programs, it is working through the existing systems, supporting either Ministry of Health facilities or some of the existing faith-based facilities. And it's their staff that are actually providing the services, but our role is to make sure that they have the technical skills, that they have the knowledge, either through training or through mentorship, 
um, to exchange visits or things like that. And like Paula said, then also supporting the facilities that they have the actual physical space to do things in the right equipment. But it's not ACPAF who are delivering the services. It's we are supporting the existing sites. And so I think, like Paula mentioned, our vision is that you know the transition goes in, in steps and it goes maybe first to, in some countries, to a local organization that's providing that support, um, or it's continued through what we are doing. But ultimately, the sites and the system should be able to provide these services. They might then still, still be uh, depending on funding to do that, but at least the capacity and the infrastructure uh, should be there to continue that. And then I think the final step will be the financial responsibility back to the countries, but that might be quite a bit longer. But it's really this whole capacity building and health system strengthening within the existing systems and within the existing services. We didn't talk much about integration within maternal and child health services, but that's another way where we uh, never set up separate prevention of mother to child transmission clinics or anything. It's all within the existing maternal and, health, uh, maternal and child health services. But that's an interesting question. Maybe it's an adaptation of Carl's questions around financial capacity to, to do things that aren't directly related to your contract. So if you're getting a contract with the CDC to provide services that are specific to HIV, maybe there's some flexibility around some related health systems. But if you're getting into integrated delivery of child health services, that's a whole range of things that are probably not going to be covered uh, with the CDC contract. So how do you deal with your want and desire and need to plug into a broader approach when your money is still uh, pretty tightly structured around HIV? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, I think from the beginning, we have uh, always been very strong supporters of, of more integrated uh, support. Most of our, our people that we work with in our countries, they were never HIV specialists. They were always doctors and nurses who, who provided support and, and services to all the different diseases. So initially, we kind of did it more secretively. We did some work in the delivery room and with the idea that you know, we, we sold it like, well, if women don't come back to the liver, we can't provide them with single dose nevirapine, what was the initial thing. So um, w yeah, we kind of played it that way. I think later on in PEPFAR, it became you know, almost a prerequisite to actually have a broader impact. And so um, I think it is much more possible, but our role at a global level and with PEPFAR and Global Fund is still to push more for this integrated services and being, uh, allowed to use uh, our funding for broader health system strengthening, which I think is really the direction that we're going and, and moving PEPFAR from an emergency response to a much more uh, integrated response is, I think, the right way and, and it really helps us do what we want to do all along. It's an interesting point, but I'm curious how people here see this, but I know when we were in South Africa with the Hill staff and we had this discussion around moving away from being in the front of delivery and often US funding the direct delivery of care to stepping behind and actually being more involved in health system strengthening, the, the Hill staff started vibrating right. too. And they said, well, you know, the, the mathematical benefit of saying this much money from the US government provides this treatment that saves this many lives um, has been extremely helpful for PEPFAR's funding. When they were asked how you're gonna measure health system strengthening, Somebody got up and said, well, we have a 13-frame matrix that's developed, you know, and the political people were like, oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, I think what's going to be really interesting is as organizations and PEPFAR both broaden their work but also look to be more supportive as opposed to directly funding the provision of care, how do we measure that in a way that's still politically satisfying and keeps the funds flowing? I think that, that's got to be an issue for some. So... Got a couple hands over here. Christine, you're going to tell us how to solve that problem, right? <laughs> so like Todd, um, uh, several of us went to South Africa last summer, and actually, you know, I will be more candid. Uh, what we saw about transition was actually very disturbing there, at least in the Durban area, in terms of tracking patients, in terms of capacity of public health clinics to provide care. So I'm very heartened 
to hear about your model. Um, and it seems to me it's, it's the kind of process that should go on irrespective of whether a country's ready to quote so-called transition, certainly financially. So my question is, is how is your experience and, and the kind of program we're hearing about today, locally grown with your help in Mozambique, being communicated to the broader PEPFAR community? Uh, because from what I hear, I mean, things are different in different countries. Track One partners had different processes for transitioning. And so, for example, are you all presenting at the PEPFAR annual meeting June 1st through 3rd? Has this been written up? Is this being shared with country teams? I think there's a couple other hands over in this neighborhood. Do you want to do that? Up here. Hi, I'm Debbie Cleel from USAID, and it's sort of a similar question, but um, thinking about monitoring this transition and how you're measuring what's happened, are you thinking about doing an evaluation of this, or is there an external evaluation going on of how this transition is working in Mozambique? Great. You want to give it to Janet, and we'll, then we'll do answers, and we'll come back over here. Thank you. This is very much in the same vein. I'm Janet Fleischman with the CSIS Global Health Policy Center, um, and I had the opportunity to meet with your affiliate and your regular EGPATH team in Tanzania a couple of years ago and as this was all underway. So it's fascinating to hear some of the experiences in Mozambique as well. And I guess one of the questions I had is to draw out some of the other lessons learned from this process. Um, you were candid in saying this was really forced by CDC. So I guess questions like, did you have enough time? Has there been backsliding? How have you measured that? What would you recommend for others that are undergoing this transition? What are some of the key things that they need to know if they're going to undertake a transition somewhat like the one that you have done, even though they'll all be different? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. So a series of questions, but all related. Why don't we work our way through? And, and Chip, you want to come can back? Start with, with the answers? last question first. You can do anything you want. <laughs> Bless. Um, it's a straightforward question, but there, there's a lot to it um, in, in the answer. So sort of what advice or what should be considered where one is thinking about um, forcing this um, transition as a part of an award or, or what have you. Um, at the beginning, I said it, it very much did feel forced, unreasonable, and unrealistic um, in terms of the, the time frame. Um, and I went back and forth on that because, uh, uh, and, and I've settled on, uh, we, like many others, might have been kicking the can down the road if we hadn't had a really hard uh, deadline. Um, when we had the closeout meeting with CDC at the end of the award, a senior CDC uh, official was extremely complimentary about what the EGPAF component, and I'm sure he was with other track one uh, implementing partners, but he referred to what had been accomplished over that eight or nine years as epic, which is not, I don't hear that word very often in terms of program uh, accomplishments and, and impact. So it was gratifying to get, but I was very quick to say uh, it's because we had epic resources. We, we can do these, these things. I don't think there's a lot of challenges and, and we'll fall down and, and make mistakes and so on. The, the key two points I would say to anybody that's having to walk down this road, as Carl said, two key, key questions to ask um, are what kind of time frame are we talking about? Is this a two or three, two to three year process or is this a five to seven year process or a seven to 10 year process? Are we clear and agreed on definitions? What is transition? Transition to whom, by whom? You can have a definition. The transition is entirely to government at a district or even a sub-district level. Um, I'm reasonably healthy, but in my professional lifetime, I don't think we're going to achieve that definition of transition. We've succeeded um, in terms of three years in the kind of transition model we've pursued. But there are, people have different views and definitions about what transition is. That's got to be tackled. If go off with different kinds of uh, assumptions or hopes uh, even, um, we're going to be in real trouble. 
And then are the resources commensurate with, uh, with the uh, outcomes sought or, th or the targets? And we're in an environment of, of flat or even declining, depending on how you uh, crunch your numbers. Um, we're in a period of targets being increased um, with the same or fewer resources. So where are the resources going to come from that pay for the incredible amount of work that goes into planning and uh, executing transition strategies and being able to recruit and retain the kind of professionals like Paula and other uh, uh, colleagues who are fully capable of doing it, but on with, with what definitions over what period of time with what resources. And those things can't just be wished to appear somehow, in, particularly in the present financial environment. Anya. Um, to answer your question, as far as I know, there is no external evaluation planned. Um, we are in the process of writing up our experience. I think we deliberately waited for a while to start doing so because we did want to see it. I mean, it's one thing to establish them and to secure funding, which in itself was a success, but then to be able to really describe how then uh, the affiliate started working uh, independently is a different story. And so we are in the process of writing that up. Um, we would welcome any um, venues to talk more about this. We are happy to be here today. We did mention it when we had a meeting with uh, Ambassador Burks recently to also really show some of the work that we've done and might be uh, of value for, for PEPFAR. Um, so to answer your question in terms of what else did we learn, I think one of the things that we learned as an international organization and that we weren't really anticipating is what effect it had on our own teams in country. Um, because I think we were so focused at the affiliates and making sure that they got all the support that they needed to be successful that we, to be honest, kind of forgot that we lost a lot of valuable staff to the affiliate and, and we didn't think that that weakened our own teams and that we needed to pay as much attention to them as, as to the team on the affiliate. So I think that's really a lesson learned that we maybe foolishly hadn't really thought about. <laughs> can, can I just comment on, on that as well? There was the whole dynamic also of when we seconded EGPAF staff to the new affiliate. So uh, it wasn't as simple as that. But Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock, you worked for an international NGO. Monday morning at 9 a.m., you worked for an, a national um, NGO. Folks were nervous. That for them, that was a risk. Do I want to leave the prestige of working for an international organization to work for a new organization whose board is just coming together, whose executive director has just been appointed, um, who doesn't have the same reputation? You'll notice the Ariel Glazer name in th all three of the affiliates. That was one way they felt that it was affiliation, but also the, the connection to the international organization they felt however sort of ephemeral was, was a connection to an international organization, that there was an, a kind of implied credibility that went with that. But I, I think there are real kudos necessary for the risk takers among the staff who wanted to sign up for this new idea of a brand new organization being stood up in relatively short order with uh, uncertain future about dedicated funding from outside the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's just one, a couple of examples of it. But the, you know, the management questions about recruiting and retaining staff, seconding them or not, do you second your very best, you know, perceived very best staff? But what about us? We're still having to perform. We still have uh, funding. There are some really complicated human resources and human resources management questions um, in there. Paula. Um, yes, I think that uh, I would agree with Chip. This overall thing could have uh, happened without f appropriate levels of funding. And the premise uh, for this is that the funding is available. But uh, that said, I, I'll repeat, uh, human resources are key uh, in this overall process. And I've testified other uh, models of transition. Uh, and in this context, I really praise the, the ECPAF affiliation model because it, it has provided us the support we needed from the beginning. It has helped us uh, identify uh, what we needed uh, 
to, to, to grow quickly because I compare this to kind of jumping on a train that is uh, driving fast. And I mean, we are jumping there naked. And we have to put the clothes. Jumping what? Naked. naked. That's what I thought. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we have to put on the clothes, and the clothes are not where they're supposed to be. And you, you need to drive the train not to let it derail. And I mean, there are so many things happen at the same time. It's, and if you have a, a strong, mature organization at your side, giving the hand, holding your hand, and helping you through. I mean, it's a great start. Uh, you, you, I mean, you, you, you really have you, you fit on Earth. And that's what the affiliation model has provided us, that good, uh, that good start. Yeah. Can, Todd, can I just add, again, of the three aff affiliates, um, in Cote d'Ivoire, the, the person that became the executive director at the start of the organization um, was former EGPAF. He was, a, he was technical uh, uh, director at, at EGPAF and then became executive director. Whereas Paula and our executive director, the executive director, um, it's not ours, uh, is, um, but the, the, uh, that affiliate executive director also uh, came from the outside. So they are hired as independent outside. So it wasn't just wholesale EGPAF secondees, but there was a, a material uh, sort of cohort of EGPAF secondees in those early days that allowed for, you could have a, um, a meeting that opened at 9 a.m. Again, I'm being simplistic, but opened for business 9 a.m. on Monday. They could have a staff meeting at 2 o'clock and talk about where their systems were and where the, et, et cetera, in time. Now, quite obviously, as they recruited, um, they were pulling um, from much wider sources to, to bring in the staff complement that they needed. So we had questions over here. Hi, I'm Juliette Glassroth from Friends of the Global Fight. I know we're talking about um, PEPFAR specifically today, but I'm curious, um, in the long-term resource mobilization vision, what are your plans to integrate with the Global Fund or collaborate with the country coordinating mechanism? Um, have you had any interactions with them to date? And in this, in the new funding model, the Global Fund's new funding model, you know, there's this desire for a more holistic country planning process, how are you integrating into that? <coughs> Thanks, so back here, and then uh, Steve. You do that in Mozambique, but do you want to speak to the larger Hi, group? my name's Natasha Sokolsky, and I'm with FHI 360. Right, yeah. I have two questions. The first is with regard to the three countries where you deemed it appropriate to set up an affiliate. You mentioned you couldn't find suitable organizations to transition to, so I'm wondering what criteria you use to determine that. And then secondly, around the issue of working for an international organization one day and then a national organization the next, what the approach to salary has been and salary differentials in that regard. Um, Steve Morrison, CSIS, thank you so much for this. Um, my question is about where do you see the, the growth in your programs coming in the future? I mean, the changes that you've enacted were ones that occurred, as you described, at sort of the end of the epic period, right? You had a strong pipeline, you had very ample resources, you had some major efficiency gains achieved, so it's possible to to have continued growth in the last several years with what seemed like relatively flat um, resources. But we're, we're out of that period now, and we're moving into a period where it's really not clear where the next, where the next growth is going to come from. If it's not coming from partner governments, or if it's not coming from private sector sources, like the, the, it, we, people seem reasonably comfortable with the thought that the USG can hold the line in terms of its baseline commitments. There's been resilience. There's political support for that. But people are not expecting any major step up of resources, and we've gone beyond that period where the pipeline was huge, the efficiency gains were, were very good, the reallocation of resources and that sort of thing. So what happens next? <laughs> 
what next? So a series of questions. Paul, I'll start with you. Um, well, we have been working with the country coordination mechanism uh, in country. Uh, we, we have been working uh, on the current proposal and we, are, we have started like uh, observers, observers, yeah. observers, but uh, we aim at uh, go a further step ahead and uh, check if we can uh, start by being sub-recipients because the many recipients are uh, clearly defined, and uh, explore it further. During the, these three years, we have applied, we, I mean, we have submitted many proposals, and uh, many weren't successful, but it was a way of creating capacity within the team. And recently, some of them uh, have been uh, awarded, and we are slowly increasing our funding diversification and we are preparing uh, the future ahead by uh, stepping a bit uh, out of HIV and integrating HIV into child survival. Mm. And we, we have been recently awarded uh, proposals on, on the nutrition field that is one of the pillars of our strategic planning. So we are slowly uh, preparing uh, the future. Can I add on the Global Fund um, question? We, so from an EGPAF point of view, we are uh, a sub-recipient um, as a technical, um, technical agency relationship in Lesotho, uh, for example. Um, we participate uh, in CCM process in a number of, of countries uh, and so on. But there's a fundamental challenge there. We'd be very... Um, interested and we think able to play a larger uh, sort of formal role with the Global Fund as a principal recipient um, uh, potentially, but there's, there's a st structural impediment to that which is the cost and which is the um, uh, cost recovery policy and so on. So, uh, you know, um, a $40 million principal recipient um, grant is going to cost an organization, depending on their uh, NICRA rate, three, four, five million dollars to subsidize that grant. We don't have, that, that's real money, um, and we don't have that in an unrestricted budget, nor do we have donors that would uh, pick that up. So um, we've, we've got concerns because we've been asked to. We were asked to, in one country, uh, to submit an L a letter of interest to be a principal recipient. It was a hard decision to decline to do that because we knew we were capable of it. It's a substantial um, resources, but that one would have been nearly five million dollars from an unrestricted budget that it can't doesn't have that kind of capacity to play that role. So you have the invitation, you have the competence, and then you get blocked. So there's no lack of interest in. Um, integrating, I think was your word, or engaging, or uh, bringing organizational and, and professional expertise uh, to the table. But there's a, it's prohibitive um, for many, not for all. Some are very good at it and have figured out um, how to do that or have um, uh, uh, angel donors um, who will cover that. Because you can make the case, it's a, you put a dollar in, you're going to get a $10 leverage by virtue of that, you know, that's a, a mo that's a easy point or comment to make, but translating that into a donor who's prepared to come up with $4 million is, uh, for that to cover somebody else's overheads is, is not likely. Or getting the government to pitch in some resources, because part of the other challenge of the Global Fund is it has co-investment requirements, and since half of its grantees are NGOs, where does the co-investment come from? Uh, I think the expectation is the government's going to pick up that share, uh, but it's a bit of a problem in a lot of countries. Anya, you had a question around uh, medical personnel yeah. and salary scale. How, how did that work? Yeah. And criteria. Um, it's, it's a very interesting question because um, there is no one answer fits all three affiliates. <laughs> um, the, all of them started with like salary scales that were kind of based on the experience of ACPAF, just because that was the easiest, but all three of them have evolved in different ways. Um, none of the affiliates have international staff, which uh, we do have in Mozambique and in Tanzania. Uh, we don't have in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so that's a difference. Um, 
we have, by the way, also in a number of other countries ourselves, no international staff, but we happen to have in, in Mozambique and Tanzania. Um, subsequently, when they started out kind of at the same level, there have been different paths taken by different uh, affiliates. Uh, one has argued that because they do not have headquarters um, that provides them with support, the responsibility of the technical director, for example, and an affiliate is more than the one in the international organization, so they have, ha they have argued that their salaries need to go up. And then another affiliate, they, they have really tried, and I think it also has to do with the local labor law, but I have to be honest, I don't know exactly, their salary skills ended up being lower. So I think, it, again, they're independent organizations. They can decide what they want to do um, with their salaries, but it has gone both ways. Um, your question around uh, the criteria used, um, when we were looking at, at that, uh, I wasn't at uh, headquarters, I actually was in Tanzania. Um, so we looked at uh, organizations in Tanzania that we felt were able uh, or good potential candidates to take over the responsibility. And we looked both in terms of, of technical capacity, um, managing, you know, whatever, $10 million of, of uh, grants, as well as uh, some level of shared mission. Um, and those were kind of the three main buckets that we, we looked at to, to see. In Zambia, for example, we did transfer to an existing local organization, CIDERS, that we had been working with very closely in the past uh, already, so we felt very comfortable there. Um, so I, I hope that answered your question. So when you're going to come back and answer Steve's big question, which is, you know, as you see expanding or unmet needs, you talked about your percentage at the beginning. We're still seeing quite a bit of coverage deficits on uh, the basic PMTCT package, much less the broader pediatric. Uh, pediatric HIV and the broader child health agenda uh, in an area where the major donors are showing less interest in giving more and where there's quite a bit of effort put in to even hold the line on what we've got. Uh, Gavi announced recently its request for its replenishment, and frankly, it was it was relatively modest. Uh, the Global Fund just had a replenishment and asked for 15 and got 12 and a half or 13, depending on how you count. So, you know, as you sit in Mozambique and you look out at the world, of, uh, particularly the donor world, where do you see new money coming in for you to address all the unmet needs you see day in and day out? Where, where do you see opportunity and where are you most concerned? <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> um, I mean, the the important amounts of money really come from the U.S. government. Uh, the other donors uh, play at a different uh, level of funding. Um, it also depends on uh, whether we continue uh, to just work strictly on the HIV or whether you broaden up your portfolio by and thereby increasing your chances of uh, getting some other funding opportunities. So, uh, and also uh, we, we in Mozambique, we can't exclude uh, the huge opportunities that we have now in country with all these uh, huge gas and coal reserves being explored and those natural resources that, uh, I mean, in some ways should benefit the country. It's my brain is saying China, China, China here. I don't know <laughs> why. Uh, Steve, well, let's get a microphone, so. On these three affiliate countries, what do you see, uh, how is it going to be possible in these three countries to get the respective governments to take on a heavier commitment. I mean, that, at the end of the day, yeah. is, the, is the code that no one's cracked yet in, in terms of sustainability and, tr and some kind of real transition towards the countries owning this problem. The growth is not gonna come in this next decade, principally <coughs> from external sources. So if there's gonna be growth, it's gonna have to come from internal. And how, what's the strategy? And how do you see the prospects for uh, it's a it's a very good question because actually as an answer to your question I was thinking um, when I attended the the ICASA meeting in um, explain ICASA International Council of AIDS Service Organizations 
It's, a, it's like the that. Africa <laughs> IAS meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry, a different uh, class. Um, there was a lot of talk about, you know, country ownership in terms of countries stepping up financially also to start contributing more. And I think, you know, there are quite a number of low income countries already moving into becoming middle income countries and, and how are they indeed going to take more responsibility? To be honest, it's, it's a very good question. I'm not sure if I have the answer exactly how we are going to contribute to that discussion at country level and, and make them um, start thinking more about that. But I do think that is the way that we need to go. It, there is no way that we can continue um, expecting the US or the European donors or China uh, to come up with more money. The countries have to ultimately step up to the plate as well and start contributing more. Um, but Steve, uh, I don't think anyone has a, a great um, or um, very specific ideas about that, but there, there or solutions uh, rather. Kyle does, but he's not going to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but I think there are at least two things that have to happen. Um, one, and maybe I should just posit this, so this will be a personal view instead of an organizational view. People are going to have to get squeezed. Uh, I, people don't respond well uh, if you can get away with a certain amount of complacency or expectations that it's just going to be ever thus at this funding level. Um, and I, I think a part of when that squeeze comes, because depending on who you listen to and what numbers you can count on or what time frame we're talking about, it could very well be that that squeeze comes. I think it is so uh, important that we have uh, uh, partners like uh, Ariel um, in Mozambique programmatically and technically, but also from a civil society voice uh, point of view. Paula can make a case to a minister of health or to other officials in Mozambique, I can do the same, guess who they're going to listen to? And it, it's not me. So the, the, I, I think the integrity of a Mozambican organization and multiple Mozambican organizations that are talking about the circumstances in Mozambique that have their own expertise. This isn't about the outsiders coming in or the donors coming in, et cetera, et cetera. I think over, and that's over quite a period of time, I think that's a, probably the most effective and the crucial step in terms of advocacy or lobbying, whatever you want to call it, for increased national uh, level investment. The meeting that, um, Anya was referring to the, the sort of Africa AIDS uh, conference. The last two I've attended, Cape Town and Addis, um, December last and two years previous. Both times I left struck by the number of Africans at the meeting who were demanding more of their own governments. They weren't standing up and saying, why is PEPFAR reducing or why is this donor? Uh, there is an expectation, whether it's pride or realism or growing economies or natural resources becoming available, that far more needs to come um, out of uh, uh, national uh, governments. I think the other component of this is, um, maybe ironically or unexpectedly, is programming effectiveness, um, by which I mean the kind of progress, just the last couple of days in Geneva, we went through a whole bunch of stuff around the global plan to eliminate pediatric AIDS and so on. It's just remarkable what has been accomplished over the last five years. And this is almost a, you know, a, a weaker argument, but at the end of the day, the investments from PEPFAR, what USAID is doing, what CS, CDC has done, what implementing partners are achieving are are quite remarkable, and yet we're still at 30% coverage for kids. We're less than 70% coverage uh, for adults. You know, I don't know how long it will last to say, have the argument be you can't cut now. Um, I, I wouldn't want to put total faith in that as a political argument, but it has the virtue of being true. We will lose huge gains if there are material reductions in the budget. So at the very least, the call has to be for maintaining funding levels over the next several years. But I have not myself sort of figured out what the, the magical argument is or strategy to, to change that. I think we have to hold or expect or at least call for more on the, on the outside side. The Brits can't, I mean, they are being spectacularly generous and they're funding lots of things, but this isn't going to rise or fall just on, on what Diffin's <laughs> able to do. 
And I think the voices of civil society calling for their own investment, I think, are going to become exponentially more important from a sort of five and seven and 10 year perspective for new resources. Carl, let me um, give Carl a microphone because I want to get a couple closing comments because you certainly organizationally face this and then we'll give our panelists a chance to come back with any final thoughts uh, and then we'll Thanks, end for today. Thanks, Todd. So I think, you know, um, Steve posed the question that is the transcendent question. How do we sustain these sorts of gains that you're describing here and given the funding picture and CHIP has given a very, I think, enlightened response to that. I would, I would say yes and. There, there, from my perspective, there are sort of four ways in which you can look at this funding challenge. One is, and each of them, by the way, I think would be a great topic for the next CSIS panel conversation. There's some pieces of paper for you there to you write go. topics down on so your chairs. So. One of them is uh, cost effectiveness, right? So, and, and there's a very good debate that could be had about whether that's best achieved in the short to medium term through international NGOs or through national NGOs. It's not clear, really, when you talk about cost effectiveness of impact. That's one. The second is mobilizing national resources. You've talked about that, and I think that's great to hear that civil society voices are really pressuring African governments in particular, but I think we all sense that that's a long way down the road before they respond meaningfully. And in a way, African governments are, are behaving rationally to the extent we're here or others are here to fund these needs. Why should they? Um, the third, I think, is the sort of untapped pool of resources that all of us in this implementing space look at that's not the big foundations, it's not the global fund, it's not big governments, it's the, it's the corporate sector, um, which is small but growing, and it's the sort of successor generation of philanthropists who are going to be receiving huge amounts of money in the coming years and who will want to be really effective at what they do with it, and I think that's a, a resource that all of us are trying to understand how to exploit and, and put to good use. And the fourth area that I also think is worth a much longer conversation it's really tied to your point about people getting squeezed. You know, at some point, the market takes over. The market will take over in the absence of resources, and we go back to a much more um, severe situation where those who have are able to deal with their problems, their health problems, and those who don't have suffer. Um, the market is also an opportunity to more rationally allocate the subsidy that's available as it goes down. And we have to ensure that as the subsidy is either flat or declining and the needs are growing, we don't overlook the ability of the market to help us do that if we guide it appropriately. As I said, you can have four conversations about those four topics, but. But can, can we vote for a CSIS session on that last topic, please? Because that's. Market solutions to this problem. Well, it's an interesting one. And social insurance schemes, which maybe are an aspect of local, is something that others are looking at. Um, so before we turn to the panels for final comments, just a reminder, there is a half a piece of paper on every chair with a little very quick evaluation. We uh, review these assiduously, so if you can fill those out, we really appreciate it. Uh, if we've done a great job, good to hear about it. If there's something that hasn't worked, details help. So if you just say Todd sucked, that's not so good. Uh, Todd sucked why is a little bit more helpful. Um, so, um, Paula, we have a chance to kind of give people sort of some final thoughts uh, today. You traveled a long distance. Thank you very much for coming to share your experiences with us. Um, what's your message to the U.S. audience that's involved in helping to attract the resources that have helped Mozambique and also is going to be looking for Mozambique to take care of more of its own solution? What, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting. This has been a, a very interesting session. Uh, I think that uh, the lessons learned is that local <coughs> organizations can perform. And I think that uh, that that's a, a good lesson. And we have premises that are funding and support. And um, we have not uh, talked enough about the governance structure and the board because it really plays a role. And I was thinking in relation to communications and advocacy and the role by uh, networking and influencing the government in terms of having an increased government uptake of, of the programs. So um, by saying that, um, I think that uh, we need to think about the future and how we can grow synergies between uh, the international and the local organizations so that we don't end by uh, undermining each other's work, but we rather build up and uh, grow as a block. 
in terms of providing better health care for those uh, who need it for the vulnerable population. Thanks, Anya. Yeah, um, thank you as well. I think it was an interesting session. I just wanted to uh, draw some attention. I think these are outside. We, we did talk about the affiliation model, but there's much more detail um, about it, of course, and, and some of this you can find in here. I think my final comment is really that um, the affiliation is, is one model that we have used for transition that I think the experience we have so far has been really good, but it's been a process and it's an ongoing process and it takes money. So I think really thinking that you can just flip very quickly without uh, this relationship can be true. An affiliation model can also be in a different uh, model, but the, the, the continuation over time, I think, to me, is very important for success. In this overlap. Yeah. Chip. I uh, just want to um, emphasize, um, Paul a couple of times commented about human resources and, and people. I, I made a comment about um, track one and remarkable accomplishment for CDC, for HRSA, and, and implementation uh, partners. It was also a possible and a spectacular accomplishment for the healthcare workers who were delivering all those services, who were enrolling all those uh, patients on uh, ART for the ministries of health that performed probably at a level that they hadn't imagined eight years before uh, was going to be possible. Um, I, I, I think too, too often we think in terms of the donors or the partners and we forget about who's really doing the work. Um, and so I, I just want to emphasize uh, that because those numbers are driven by nurses and nurse assistants and, and others at the, at the health sites. Um, uh, and then on the, on the theme of it's about people more than brilliant egg, char uh, egg charts um, <laughs> or uh, org charts or strategies, uh, I want to congratulate Paula, but um, by extension her team and her board of uh, directors. Um, in Tanzania, uh, Anthony uh, Tona, his team, their board of directors, um, and in, uh, in, did I say Tanzania? Uh, Anthony is in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and uh, Lorianne Buonacuna in, in uh, Tanzania, his board and his team, because we could have done a similar sort of slice and examination of what this transition process is like, what the accomplishments are, and so on. Um, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, we happen to focus on uh, Mozambique. But <coughs> Paul, you did a very good job. Thank you, as, as ever. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, always. And a lot of these things, a lot of issues get raised. And, and we try to keep these brief enough to, to maintain interest. But we poked on a lot of things. We'll do some future sessions on this, uh, hopefully with the guidance that you're going to write down on those pieces of paper. I uh, wish you all a great uh, holiday weekend. Enjoy the time together. Um, thank you very much for attending, uh, Paul, especially for traveling so far. Join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.